It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. And this episode used to be common when you turned 17, 18 years old, you were on your own. I have a friend who at 15 was on his own. Today, that's not the norm. In fact, uh, people argue, what is the age that someone becomes an adult? Now they use this term, emerging adult. So today, so many connections to our kids continue that are financial. They stay on our family cell phone plans, our health insurance. I'm guilty of that for my 23-year-old, both of those things. And is it right for us to do that as a parent, to keep our kids involved financially where we're taking care of some of these things for them? It's a tough question. And later... I've talked about all my trackers. I've got my Garmin fitness tracker, my Samsung smartwatch, my Aura ring. And yes, I guess that I have an obsessive issue that I'm doing all this. But do you know that some of the health places out there are spying on us, tracking us, and sharing our information with others do you know if anything you're doing is doing that kind of stuff? We're going to talk about that. So this is something that we were talking about. This came up as a topic to talk about on the podcast when we were having a meeting of several of us from the website and from the Team Clark Consumer Action Center and uh, uh Krista and me in this meeting, we're all talking, and we were talking about why is it in the United States and Canada, unlike virtually every other country on earth, people switch who they get their cell phone plan from all the time. There's just routine that people would get their cell phone service this month from this company, and then there might be a deal. They'd be at the supermarket, and they'd see a deal for the month of November, and so they'd buy this other company's card for that month, and they'd have the SIM for them. It would be an electronic SIM, and they'd buy that, and they'd just switch. And, you know, they just, the number instantly ports from this company A to company B to company C or whatever. And then um, our head of team Clark, Lori said, family plans. That the cell phone carriers have come up with this way to create a hotel California you can check out but you can never leave with cell phone plans by having the tie-in where it gets so complicated because you have all these people on your plan. I have 14 people, 14 lines on my plan. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> Christy, you have four? No, I because we have a couple of watches, so we have six. Six, but you've got four people. Four people, six lines. And so can you see a situation where your daughter, when she finishes college in two, three years, and she's out in her first job, She'll still be on your plan, and then ten years after that, she'll still be on your family plan. I can see it, but we probably we might ask her to pay for it at that point. Ah, <laughs> what an interesting thought! Because that is the second issue. There are a lot of things like health insurance. Okay, so when you have multiple kids under the law, they can stay. If you're with a large employer, they can stay on your health insurance till you're 26. So. It costs nothing for my 23-year-old, it costs me nothing, for her to remain on the plan because once with most plans, once you get past one kid, second, third, fourth, fifth, they're all free. So there she is. She's done with college. She's out on her own, but she's getting health insurance from me. Her cell phone is from me. I'm not charging her for her cell phone. That was an interesting thought that... Uh, it saves a lot of money 
because I signed her up when she was $10 a month to add to the plan. So where's she going to go find unlimited everything right. for $10 a month? So she stays on the plan. And there are so many modern things like that, streaming services, where in a family people share all this stuff. And it can even be with non-family members. Uh, I remember uh, we used to have a longtime employee named Joel who worked when I used to do the radio show work for us. And he was doing a deal with Sprint. There was a family plan for 10 people for $100 a month. But he was the only family member of those 10. <laughs> and he'd have to go around every month and collect money from all the people he had on the plan. He'd have some deadbeats. Uh, but he was getting $10 a month service. So there's so many things now that it becomes fuzzy and gray how we create this financial independence with our kids because there are more and more tie-ins where it just happens by inertia the kids were part of a service when they were kids they become young adults and it just stays and so it's almost like uh there's puppet strings there that the kids don't get out completely on their own so you bring up a really valid point. You say, hey, you know, now that you got your first job, it's time for you to pay. This is how much it is a month for your share of the Netflix. This is how much it is a month for your share of the cell phone and all that. Auto insurance. Oh, auto insurance. Well, that's really interesting because my uh, 23-year-old who recently finished college, we're about to sell her the car and she will be on her own for the auto insurance. Mm. And so I, I called her, I said, are you ready, Steffi, to own the car and pay, for, pay the insurance and all that? So with our kids, we kind of have to either tell them, this is how it is, or you nudge them along, or you leave them on the mommy daddy dole. But these are all things that didn't used to happen. You know, it used to be when when you hit late teenage years, you were you were really on your yes. own, and that started changing after World War II, and in the 1950s, it it and it kept and it's continued to change, and now there's a huge number of adult children living in the household of their parents. And then there's issues, who buys the groceries? And all these subscriptions, Amazon Prime, whatever it is. Yeah, right. There's so many subscriptions yeah. now. So as a parent of emerging adults or adult kids, what is reasonable, you have to decide under your own roof. And you don't just issue orders to your kids. It's an ongoing conversation as you build in more and more financial independence. All right. This question is from Benjamin in Massachusetts. Clark, I know this is very personal, but what can you share as a highly successful person financially about how you think about what, how much, how much, and at what age to leave assets to the next generation? Enough for a safety net, enough to be wealthy, the same for each child, the same adjusted by time value of money for different age beneficiaries, or adjusted for their personal financial circumstances. Do you discuss your intentions ahead of time? So what I've told my three children is that they will receive, at time of, of my death, that they will receive some money, but the rest is going to charity. Um, I, I've felt that it's important in every individual, and this is key, Benjamin, every individual has to approach this, what's right for them. And... My wife and I have had a lot of conversations about this because she feels like we have really industrious kids and that... You do. Well, I'm fortunate They're that great. way. Yes. They have, they have really strong work ethics. Mm -hmm. And so them receiving more, she and I go back and forth. And when we, last time we were at the estate attorney and we were talking about this, it was really interesting Lane and I had to compromise because I was like, I just want it all to go to charity. 
And she was like, no, 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 no. And so we, we reached a compromise on this, Benjamin. And I love that you're asking something that really was very, uh, it was almost contentious with us going back and forth about it. And we reached an understanding. The other thing is that under the law, you're allowed to give each of your kids 16 grand starting in January. It'll be 17 grand. There's no gift tax, uh, estate tax, no implications at all. In fact, you can give, uh, if you're really generous, Benjamin, you can walk down the street and give 16 grand to this person, 16 grand to that person. It's like, the was it the Oprah thing? Everybody gets a car. Everybody <laughs> yeah. gets one. Uh, and there's no tax for you. There's no tax for them. There's no deduction for you, nothing. So I would say with your kids, um, and if you have a lot of money, you've got estate tax you're avoiding. If you dole out money every year and give them money towards um, uh, just their normal living, and again, 16 and 22, 17,000 and 23. If they're married, you can give money to their spouse. If you're married, you can basically quadruple that 16 becomes 64, that 17 becomes next year 68. You can also pay tuition and have that not count towards it. Uh, where you pay straight to a school, there are various expenses you can pay. And then the big one right now that has happened in a lot of families that have uh, more wealth, and Benjamin, the way you phrased your question, I imagine you have decent resources, is the big leg up you can give your adult children is assistance towards down payment for a house. Um, housing costs are so much higher for today's young adults or even older than young adults trying to buy a first home that help with a down payment for a house is one of the areas you can really help. If you have decent assets, you could even be the bank and do the mortgage and the kids are paying the mortgage back to you. You just got to really think through each child, how responsible he or she is. On the last thing you asked, different ages, giving money, adjusting for their personal circumstances. I think if you are going to give, like, let's say there's a kid who's done really well, and you feel like there's, it's not necessary for you to give that child anything, explain it to them over time not a single conversation explain over time why it is that it's not any less love for them but you want to make sure that the money goes to who needs it the most so this is a very complicated topic and one where you can hurt a lot of people's feelings so that's why you don't keep it a secret it needs to be an ongoing conversation from Robert in Virginia, I've heard Clark say many times how he matched every dollar his son saved. To put money into a Roth IRA, the money has to be earned. So did his son put earned money into an IRA, and then Clark gave the match money to his son to spend on toys and video games? Or was the deal that he had to put the money from dad into a regular savings account? I'm interested in doing something like this for my grandsons, but I want to understand more. Okay, so here's what I did, Robert. And I did this with... My two older kids, my daughters, and now with my son. That when they are working a job, because I required all three of my kids to get a job when they were 15, a regular job. Every dollar they don't spend from their summer job, I match up to you. And as you said, you can't give them more than what they earn from a job. So let's say they earn from a summer job, part-time job through the year, uh, $2,000. And... Your kid is a good saver and saves, or grandkid in this case, saves $1,000. I then match the 1000 so the full $2,000 that would be eligible to go in a Roth IRA goes in. If a kid saves all the money they make from a job, there's no room for the match. So in that case, all the kid would have to do in my family situation was save half of what they make I match that half with an equal dollar 
and they end up with a full contribution to a Roth. So uh, beyond that, I don't know. I mean, it's all about creating that savings habit and getting that Roth started young, that's my thing. That's why I call it the mommy-daddy match. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about health tracking apps. And a gotcha you need to be aware of with health sites that a new investigative report found a lot of them are doing things with sensitive personal information you might be very unhappy to know, and I'm going to share with you straight ahead. You ever heard of a search engine and browser called DuckDuckGo? DuckDuckGo is something I've talked about for a long time and has become pretty popular in recent years. They actually have some meaningful market share, although Google still dominates completely. Because DuckDuckGo was started from the ground up as a privacy-oriented search engine and now, by extension, an app for your phone that you can use as a browser. And they and the Washington Post did an investigation recently of how various health apps don't keep our information private. And this is a problem we talked about before there was another investigation years ago about going to uh, health information sites and looking up things, and then all of a sudden you were getting ads everywhere about whatever condition it was you were doing the research on. And I talked before about how you've got to use a really solid privacy-related tool like the Brave browser, if you ever heard of Brave, if you're searching a medical condition that you go to a private browsing session and then you use one of those websites and you do that. There's been a reason I mentioned Brave is there's been a lot of pushback that Google, if you do a private browsing session using Chrome, that it's not really private from Google. And that with medical stuff, a lot of medical things are very, very private. Um, this issue's come up with the um, 23andMe and Ancestry.com as they're collecting DNA on you. Where's that information going to end up? Are insurance companies going to be able to use it in certain ways to discriminate against you? Are there things that are going to happen if you search a particular sensitive medical topic and suddenly you're being uh, solicited to, you know, you should try this for that or that for the other. And what was fascinating in the research done by The Post and DuckDuckGo that a lot of these organizations we would expect potentially to be protecting our private information, in fact, are sharing it in a number of ways. And if you look at uh, WebMD, according to their research, that they are involved in taking your information and making money from advertisers. There's something called the... Um, period calendar period tracker that women use that gave information they could market to people based on that. Drugs.com sharing. And there was a, one site after another. Drugs.com is an example with their Android app. They were sending data to more than 100 outside entities, including advertising companies. And when people were searching particular conditions, they were including uh, terms like Adderall, diabetes, herpes, pregnancy, HIV. I mean, when people are researching things that are very personal to them and sensitive conditions, it's pretty upsetting 
that this information is being shared. WebMD was sharing with advertising companies along with user identifiers, according to this research, addiction, depression. WebMD refused to comment. That's disturbing. And it goes on and on with your information being shared and ads being targeted at you. So know that with the apps, you have danger. Now, the research they did was all Android. I, I can only guess that they weren't doing iPhone because Apple has tighter restrictions on information, potentially. But I, that's only a guess on my part, Krista. But I've researched stuff on medical sites. Oh my gosh, I've researched stuff for myself and everyone I know. So, and and I understand like sometimes sites, you know, they they want to understand what you've searched so that then you, they can serve you ads you might want or whatever. But you know, medical stuff I always use now <clears throat> an anonymous browser. But I mean, I, forever I research things. You, I, there's an anonymous browser called Now? No. Oh, I thought you were saying now I, oh. Now, now, so like today. because I was talking about Brave and stuff. Oh, sorry. No, so, today I use an anonymous okay. um, browser. but Which um, one do you use? I just do an anonymous tab on Chrome. Okay. So the one that I said earlier may or may not be safe enough because Google's prying eyes are there. So you can use these alternatives to search. Just know that if you do app-based use, app-based app searches, that your information almost certainly could be floating out there. And so best is to use a private browser and do a search there. If it's information, you don't want somebody else's prying eyes that, I mean, you want to get information. You don't want it to be shared with all these other parties. You know what I wonder too, like another step to take now might be to create a separate email address that is just for registering for apps and things like that. So that way, if you're getting emails and, and you're in, and a di use a different name, I think we have to sort of really start, I mean, it's probably too late <laughs> for me and other people, but you know, for future stuff, I think I'm going to start doing that. So my son's always done that. Mm -hmm. He's always had, uh, he calls his junk email address. Mm -hmm. So he, any registration he does at any business is always the junk email address. Yeah, but even a different name and everything. So uh, That's going pretty far. Okay. You ready for some questions? I'm ready. Andrew in California wants to be healthy. He says, what's the deal with my gym requiring me to give a deposit out of my bank account? They want my checking account number and bank routing number. As for me, I try not to give anybody that information. I especially do not want to give it to some fitness company. I have contacted the manager at the local fitness center, and there was nothing he could do. And I tried online, and there was no way around it. So this is Planet Fatness we're talking about, because yes. we've had this question Planet before. Planet Fitness, which you call Planet I Planet Fatness. Fatness. You know, I call everything something else. Uh, so at Planet Fitness, they're a no-frills gym fastest growing uh, fitness chain in the United States. And their deal is their plans start at $10 a month. They top out at, I think, 26 a month or something. And with them, uh, they won't take credit cards. They do a debit. They don't want a debit card because there's fees with that. They do a draft of a checking account for your monthly dues. Uh, this isn't a gym we've had complaints about. You've belonged with, there before. I did. What did years, you do? Yeah, I was. I I set it up with an account. I you know my your junk account. My junk, your junk account. Ch checking account. Yeah. So we've talked about that a lot on the podcast. That this is a perfect example of what you do with your separate account. That's for things that are vulnerable, like uh, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. Never use Zell, never use Zell, never use Zell, never forget that. <laughs> anyway, and um, with uh, Planet Fatness, having them tied in and taking your 10 to $26 a month in that separate account would be just fine. Don't ever have the separate checking account at the same bank you have your regular account at. Because all the giant monster mega banks 
do a cross collateral clause, which means if you overdraw, let's say somebody is hacking and they're stealing money from one account at that bank, the bank reserves the right to just come in and take money from another account you have with them. So you always want to have your separate checking account, usually with a credit union or an online bank where the checking accounts are free and you don't have to worry about the bank having one of these cross collateral clauses where even if you get hacked or defrauded, that they're coming in and they're stealing the money from you, which the thief was trying to steal from you and then the bank tries to do so also. Dan in Ohio says, no question here, just a tip for your caller who worries about a flat tire with no spare tire. Once a month, check your tire depth with a penny. If you think your tires are worn down and need replacing, turn the penny upside down so Lincoln's head is close to the tire and place it in several grooves. If you see that the top, if you see the top of Lincoln's head, I'd look into getting new tires before getting a flat. Which is a great suggestion, Dan, uh, not just for the flat, because a lot of times a flat will happen because you hit an object mm -hmm. and that causes the flat. But so many people are putting themselves in danger. Uh, we're moving in the time of year that weather conditions are more dicey. To check the tread on your tire is a really, really great idea. Also, tires today have a little um, line that, uh, you know, in the tread. Have you ever heard me explain this? No. They have a little line, so if the tread's going uh, one way, there's this little perpendicular line that if that perpendicular line is uh, exposed, if it's really at a point where it's hitting the tread uh, left to right, it means that your tires are too worn. The Lincoln Penny is the traditional way, but this is the other way is now the tires have this built-in a visual, visible warning for you where you can see that tire is past its useful life. It needs to be replaced. And keep them inflated, right? Keep them inflated properly. You know, modern cars will even tell you mm -hmm. which tire is low and how many PSI it has. And then in the driver door, there's a plate there that tells you what the proper PSI is for the front and the back. Many modern vehicles have different PSI for the front than the back. You just look at that and make sure you're doing the right amount. From Jeffrey in South Carolina, I listen to your podcast while I'm out walking my dog in my cheap but very comfortable walking shoes. <laughs> I recently bought and installed a smart thermostat. My question and concern, my electric utility company sent me a $75 virtual prepaid card as an incentive to let them override my temperature setting during high demand periods by up to four degrees. As part of being enrolled in en the EnergyWise Home Program, is it, do you think this is a wise and normal trend for smart thermostat users? So I was part of this program years ago when my utility had it and permitted it, and I loved it. Because, you know, you sweat a little bit more for a little while, but what it does is it eliminates uh, them having to buy peaker power. Uh, peaker power is during hot summer days, typically, there will be certain hours of peak demand, and power companies have to buy backup power at the very highest rates and run them through what's known as a peaker plant which is one that just kind of sits there. So the last kilowatts a power company has to generate on a really hot day cost a fortune. And so you also help eliminate, or you help make the power grid more reliable on hot summer days if you sign up for one of these programs. There's not a huge amount of benefit for you but there's an overall benefit to society. You'll save a little bit of money on your own bill, but the bigger benefit is for all your neighbors, your community, your area, and your state if you allow the utility company to boost by four degrees your power. I also just want to point out that someone else wrote in saying, and I've had a couple people write, write in about this recently, that when you're talking about people installing like solar or saving money on different, these energy efficiency things, that you should look first to your utility company to see what benefits might be offered through them because there are often incentives for these things, so. 
That's a great idea. And the power companies have enormous incentive to try to get people to, uh, to avoid using power on those peak days. I don't know if you know, uh, there are people, people really do care. Most of us do care about our, our community and our wider society. In California recently, where the power grid is very unstable for a number of factors, uh, the utility company sent out texts to people saying, if you could, could you dial back your energy use a little bit for the next hour so we could avoid brownouts? And believe it or not, people responded and they avoided the brownouts on, I think, three different occasions. And so people will, if they're given a, a task to do that's simple for a short period of time, they most people will do it and help out their fellow citizen, help out their fellow member of their community, their state, their country. And I think that's great. We, I think most of us inside us have an altruism that we have an altruistic streak there are people who are narcissists that everything's just about them but i think most of us really do when we're called upon to make a difference want to make that difference and what you're doing jeffrey is exactly that kind of thing so i want to thank you so much for listening on your walk in your cheap tennis shoes or your commute or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider posting a review of it and sharing what we do with a friend.